Howdy folks, Scott and Fisher here, and today we're going to take you through another Magic the Gathering illustration. This one from my card, Catalia of the Vast. You can see the card on the left and the painting on the right. Let's get into it. We did thumbnails to begin with, A and B. They chose B, but we did some edits on it. This is my digital version of it. So this is me looking at reference and, you know, combining things out of my head to kind of come up with this drawing. Now then, I make a traditional drawing based on that. This drawing is done in FW acrylic ink, and I even used some gold ink and some other stuff on there, and you kind of zoom around it. You can see how I worked in color zones, even in this preliminary drawing, because that's what this is. This isn't the final piece of art. This is just practice. <laughs> but it looks pretty cool, and I thought, you know, using the different colored zones looks pretty rad, as well as hopefully keeping in mind what's gonna come. So after we get that preliminary drawing done, we go bigger, and now I've transferred it down to a 24 by 36 gessoed panel, and I'm using the FW acrylic ink again, and we're inking it up. Here's the bottle of FW acrylic ink, and you can see that I'm going to town here. I'm using Nico nib pins. They're like this. They're little metal pin nibs, old school style. You dip it in the ink, you draw the little picture. That's how it goes down. Now, you can see that I'm hustling on here. Now, of course, this is time lapse, but really, I, you know, at this point, I've drawn it for the second time, but it's getting refined, or the third time, it's getting refined every single time, though. Just look how much depth I'm able to create in that hair by having it overlap and go underneath each other. It's one thing when I see somebody do spaghetti hair, which is when hair goes everywhere and it's all over the place, but that's a little bit more controlled what you see there. I'm really thinking about the planes and the intersections. Now, people often say, Scott, you must draw really fast. You know what? Here you go. This is one minute of me drawing in real time because everybody sees the, the you know the time lapse stuff and they're like, they know it, that's not how fast I draw, but they have this perception that it goes really fast. Look how controlled it is. This is almost painful. In fact, while you guys watch this minute, I'm gonna go ahead and go and get a drink and maybe you know run a lap or two. I'll be right back. No, I kid. But yeah, that is how slow this process is. It's very methodical. I'm thinking about every line. I'm thinking especially about intersecting points where one line intersects another. Like if you look at my fingers here, where this finger intersects that finger right there, that is an important point for me that I will focus on. And when you when you pay attention to those intersecting points in your drawing, it actually adds a great deal of depth to it. And that's how you get that feeling that things are overlapping. Because if you look at this, there's really no shading on it, right? So any depth I'm creating is just done with intersecting lines, basically. All right, back to high speed. You guys are welcome. We don't have to watch that painfully, slow, slowly, 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 slowly. And by the way, that real time was actually the preliminary drawing, but now we're back on the real board doing it on the final piece that will be the final painting. All the details are kind of worked out for me at this point. It's a little bit on autopilot, but still, every time I revisit the drawing, I'm thinking about it again. You know, I went ahead and filled in the tattoo design on her leg because I knew I was going to glaze over that with middle values later and I wanted to be able to see it. If you look at even at the wings, they almost present like a spiral staircase effect. If you look at the spines of the wings, like that's another way to create depth, right? Anytime you can find those, even look at the wrinkles that are on our hip in that fabric. There's almost like there's little tiny spiral staircases everywhere where all these lines are intersecting. Just another way to build depth. Down at the bottom, I went ahead and had her stand on a skull. It was kind of an afterthought because most of that is cropped off the card anyway, and you certainly won't see it on the real card because it's behind a block of text. There you go, there's a real close-up of the hair and, and how we went in and out of it. All right, with that done, I went ahead and started planning some of the middle values that we're gonna do. I have an idea for this because of the tonal study I had done before, and I'm slowly working it. But honestly, I'm being a little bit chicken about it. I'm really going a little slow for this. I might have spent a little bit more time on my value study beforehand, so instead I'm just trying to kind of figure this out. But finally, we committed. We went a little bit darker on the wing. Definitely on the hips. You can see I'm doing that thing I've talked about before where the red of this of the of the scarf around her hips doesn't go as dark as the leather that's kind of around her hips, right? Because I want it to stand out. There's the detail on the armor. And we go ahead and do a little bit more detail on the face. And this is just gonna show some of the how I work up these values here in this section. And the idea here is that I want to kind of do more detail on the wing, but I don't want it to distract from the hand that's holding that staff, right? So I've got to be a little careful here. So I'm building up these lighter values around the wing, around that hand, 
in the feathers. But if you notice, I'm not taking those letter values all the way out to the edge of the wing. I'm really keeping them controlled right around that hand. Think about it like a gradient in Photoshop. If you were to drop a ball gradient right behind that hand, whoosh, and it went out, that's sort of what that light green is doing, which by the way, is this awesome color, Golden Fluid Acrylics. They're, what is it? Titan Green Pale. Boy, that's a cool color, man. I love it. Literally, it's a cool color. But okay, so now we're going with a little bit more dark. Because, you know, as I traveled away from those lighter sources, I wanted to go ahead and punch in a little bit of those nooks and crannies of darks. But notice I'm not going nearly as darks as the darks in the staff, right? You might be, you might feel like, oh, if you're, especially if you're kind of rendering out of your head, you think I'm not done till I go all the way to black or all the way to white on something. But that's not always the right answer. So now we're busting out a little bit more detail in the wing. Now, if you notice, I'm almost using the same color for all of that highlighting on the wing. But based on the distance between my cross hatching, it actually has a different effect. Like if I built up the cross hatching really tight in areas, it's going to look like really opaque and brighter. But if I let a little bit more of that undercolor breathe through, you're actually going to, you know, kind of see it as like a middle value almost because your eyes are optically blending what's happening between my little tiny strokes that I'm doing everywhere building up some highlights and some more darker middle values in the hair. Of course, I collected the darks, the darkest darks, right behind her head, right? Because that's where we want the bounce. So the biggest point of contrast, where the lightest thing is hitting the darking thing, is generally right around her head there. And there we go, all rendered up on her for the most part. And then we're going to go ahead and work up the background a little bit more. This is just me working in some orange and some different kind of things that I had in mind. Again, I hadn't really done a color study on this one either, so I'm sort of figuring out as I go. And it's okay. You know, it's okay to sort of experiment and, and, and sort of find it in the medium. Some magical things can happen when you do that if you don't plan every single thing out ahead of time. Um, so, you know, it allows me the chance to kind of explore a bit, but the reality is, is it's because the drawing is there, right? I've drawn it now three or four times. The drawing is solid. That liberates me. That actually makes it so that I can have fun with the application of paint. I can think about the, the washes and the drips and all that stuff that's kind of going on in this thing. I can totally like, like enjoy that aspect of it because I'm not going to sweat how the hand is drawn or how the face is drawn or any of that stuff. There's me using some darker green behind that wing there to try to get the wing to bounce out a little bit more. And we did some little simple straps around the legs down below. Again, you're not even going to see that on the actual card because from her thigh down, pretty much, it's behind the block of text that's on a magic card. But we're just going to build that up. Then we go ahead and just throw a few more strokes down on that skeleton skull uh, rock thing that she's standing on. Just pushing it a little bit further, you know, because it is going to be original art after all. So I, I didn't want it to be completely untouched down there. So we just work it up. And you can see I'm just pushing myself towards the, through the middle values and into the dark. And there you go, guys. This is the final piece for Kalia of the Vast. A little close-up of the head there. A little dramatic zoom. Ooh. That gives you a scale for it. Again, 24 by 36. And there's the final crop I suggested to them. And uh, here is the final painting. All right, guys, that's going to do it. I appreciate you sticking with me through this and sticking with me for that one minute of live footage. Hopefully we'll do it all again real soon. Thanks a lot.